Hello, uh, my name is Alberto Loarte. I am the head of the science division at ITER. And in this ITER talk presentation, I'm going to discuss tokamak physics for nuclear fusion. So this is the physics of ITER plasmas and also what the physics that justifies the design of ITER. I acknowledge the contribution of many of my colleagues in the science division, the ITER project, and ITER fellow scientists and collaboration to this presentation. So the first thing is why do we have this talk? The, this talk we have because ITER, as you know, is a tokamak design to demonstrate the production of fusion power up to the level of 500 megawatts. And for this, we need to uh, operate plasmas at very high temperatures with currents of up to 15 megaamp and in a toroidal field of 5.3 Tesla. So it is a tokamak and therefore what we are going to describe here what is the physics basis of this tokamak and the plasma that we are going to produce and also the, the impact of this physics basis on the design of ITER, why ITER has the size that it has here. As you see, ITER is a very large tokamak and we produce plasmas with an approximate volume of almost a thousand cubic meters. Now, first we start with an introduction in which we review the, the basis for the deuterium tritium nuclear fusion process, then what are the requirements that we have to meet to achieve nuclear fusion. This leads to uh, the matter to be in a particular state that is not the one more common on Earth, which is called a plasma, and I will explain what is the characteristic of, of such state, and particularly the interaction between the particles in this, in this state of the matter. And then what do we need to uh, do to actually achieve DT fusion power production in an effective way. Uh, here we have the DT uh, nuclear fusion reaction. The DT nuclear fusion reaction is the uh, reaction between two types of hydrogen, heavy hydrogen, which are called deuterium and tritium. These react together to a nuclear uh, process and they produce helium and uh, neutrons. Helium takes part of the energy which is produced in this reaction. Neutron takes most of the energy and this energy comes because the mass of the products of this reaction is actually lower than the mass of the original DT, uh, the D, the original DT nuclei. Most of the energy, as I said, is taken by the neutrons. This is what will be used in the fusion reactor plant to produce electricity. And the energy taken by the helium, which in fusion we call alpha particle, because this is the way it was called when it was discovered by Rutherford. Uh, this takes a part of the energy. At this energy, which is about one, one, one fifth of the, of the total is used in a fusion reactor to heat up the deuterium and the tritium mix, as I will explain later. The, the main advantage of this reaction is that it has a very uh, large production per unit mass converter. So compared, for instance, to, to fission reaction, uh, the, the DT fusion reaction per, per, nuclei in the, per neutron in the, in the nuclei is about uh, four times more effective. Now, uh, what do we need to achieve a nuclear fusion? Well, what we need is that the deuterium and the tritium uh, nuclei get together to such a close distance that the nuclear interactions can take place. And because deuterium and tritium are charged, they are nuclei, so they have a positive charge, they repel each other. So this means we have to launch a deuterium and a tritium nuclei against each other with sufficient speed. So this is a bit like what is shown on the left side you need to the deuterium and the tritium to go over the, the, the top of the mountain so that they can fall in the valley. And this requires a given energy. Fortunately, there are effects due to quantum physics that actually reduce this amount of energy. And this is called the tunnel effect, by which um, particles can go through barriers without actually having to go uh, over them. And when this process takes place, then a helium a nuclear, an alpha particle is produced, and a, nitro, a neutron is released. Now, how do we increase the velocity of the deuterium and the tritium? And this is what is illustrated in this video. So you can see here this uh, a simulation of gas particles in a box, and what it shows the, the dial is the temperature of the, of the gas increasing. And what you see is that the higher the temperature, the higher the speed of the particles. So what we use in nuclear fusion to produce nuclear fusion in a tokamak is to increase the plasma temperature. This makes the speed of the particles higher, so the speed of the deuterium and the nuclear of tritium nuclei higher, and this actually leads to the triggering of, of nuclear fusion reactions. So now, what happens when we increase the temperature of matter 
that as we need, as we will see, to achieve a nuclear fusion. What happens is we normally have a matter that changes its state as it, it is subject to different temperatures. For instance, water, uh, typically at very low temperatures, under zero degree, is ice, and this is uh, the normal state of matter at cold temperatures from water. Then when we increase the temperature, it becomes liquid, and this is the normal state that we find of water in our everyday life. Now, when we heat up water more uh, to higher temperatures than 100 degrees C, the water becomes gas. And now what happens when we heat up the water even to very high temperatures? What happens in this case is that the particles of water or, or any gas start to collide to, with each other to very high energy, as shown in the previous slide. And some of the electrons, which are in the atoms of, this, of these molecules, start to be lost through these collisions. And when this happens, we obtain a new state of matter, which is called a plasma, which is what we use to produce a nuclear fusion. In this state of matter, you have electrons and, and, and ions with the, with the default of electrons, so what we call uh, atoms with the default of electrons, which we call ions, that are together, in a, interact each other, and this gives the plasma specific properties which we use for nuclear fusion. So as I said before, the velocity of the of the of these particles in the plasma depends on the temperature, and this goes with the square root of the mass of the particle and its temperature. And to give an idea, uh, the the ions, the deuterium and tritium ions in a in a fusion plasma typically move at rather high velocity of the order of a thousand kilometers per second. This is very high, still much lower than the speed of light, which is three hundred thousand kilometers per second. And now. What happens with these particles in this plasma, which contains electrons and anions, that the forces by which they interact are the Coulomb force. So this is the force that is established between two charged particles that we know from high school physics that depends on the distance between these two particles squared. And so what happens is that an electron, when it approaches an ion, is deflected by the by the, this Coulomb force, this electrostatic force, and the probability of this collision between this electron and the ions, or between two electrons, goes as the speed, inversely as the speed of this particle. So the higher the particle moves, the lower the probability of collision. And it actually goes as one of the square of the, of the, of the plasma temperature. Now, this gives the plasma specific properties, such as, for instance, which are unusual in normal matter, which is that the resistivity of the plasma, which is the resistance that the plasma uh, puts to conduct current, actually decreases with temperature. The higher the temperature the plasma has, the lower, the, the easier it is to induce a, a current in the plasma. This is very important and is used in ITER to actually achieve these very high plasma currents, which I mentioned, which are 15 mega. These are typically million, more than a million times larger than the, the current that we have in a normal wire in a socket at, at home. Now, as I said, this is, uh, I saw it in, on, the, on the right figure, the resistivity of an ITER plasma, and the star puts a typical value of two microns per centimeter. And this is to compare, for instance, with the resistivity of copper, which is shown here. And as you can see here, two microns per square per centimeter is actually the resistance of copper at room temperature. But you also see that unlike plasmas, the, the temperature of the resistance of copper actually increases with the temperature. And this is what allows us, for instance, to use uh, electric current going through copper to heat up our houses. This is the typical electric heater. You make a plasma, a current to run through the copper, this increases temperature, increases resistance, and the wire becomes hot and it heats you up. In a plasma, this is not possible because the hotter the plasma is, the less it heats up because of this ohmic heating. So this makes uh, these interactions, the fact that the interactions in the plasma are governed by the electrostatic force gives it rather unusual properties that we use to achieve fusion. So now, what are the conditions that we need to, to achieve in the plasma to get DT fusion power production? These conditions are, um, are such that the energy produced by fusion power has to be larger than the losses from this hot gas, which we call plasma, that we have to create to trigger fusion. And this uh, it was a criteria developed in the, in, the, in the 1950s by Lawson that identified what are the density of the plasma, the temperature of the plasma that you need to achieve, and what is the time the plasma has to keep the energy to make this, this uh, balance to be positive. 
And this is what is shown in this graph, where the product of the density of the plasma and the time the energy stays in the plasma is shown versus a plasma temperature. And what you see here is that there is a minimum in this in this uh, in this criterion, typically about few hundred uh, million degrees Celsius or Kelvin, at which fusion power becomes more favorable. The production of fusion power becomes larger than the losses of the plasma. So this tells you if you want to achieve fusion in the most effective way, you have to achieve temperatures typically of the order of few hundred uh, million uh, degrees C. And this is what we are doing in ITER. Now, this doesn't tell you this criteria how much power you actually produce. It just tells you that you achieve more power from fusion than the plasma loses. The actual level of, of fusion power is determined by the density that you have of deuterium and tritium and the probability that they react. And this is what is shown in this plot, is the probability that there is a reaction in terms of reaction per cubic meter per second versus the temperature of the plasma in the region of interest. So you of course see that when you are in the region of few hundred uh, million degrees, the, the probability is highest, but you also see that it depends on the temperature of the plasma with the square. So actually, at the end, what you end up is that the fusion power you produce is proportional to the square of the plasma pressure. And this is why when we try to achieve a, a scenario that produce a, a large amount of fusion power, we try to maximize the plasma pressure. This is a driving uh, driving uh, criteria to achieve fusion power, and this leads to specific instabilities that I will discuss later, that we have to control in ITER to have effective fusion power production. So now that we have uh, gone through the basic conditions we have to achieve to get uh, fusion power to be effective, I, I will describe what are the basic physics of these plasmas for magnetic confinement. This is quite important because these plasmas are very hot, are dense, and they have to keep the energy. And how do we do that? And for this, we use magnetic fields. And uh, the basic of, of magnetic confinement is based on the fact that particles which are charged, like the electrons and the ions in the plasma, when they interact with the magnetic field, it, move, it changes its movement. So if we have a cylinder of gas, with particles moving at high temperature, which is shown on the left side. You see the particles move in all directions, so a hot particle can go outside the cylinder and interact with the wall that contains the plasma and loses the energy very fast. When we put a magnetic field, the particles are forced, what, what is called the Lorentz force, which is the, the caused by the velocity of the particle and the magnetic field, and it makes the particle to go around in circles around the magnetic field lines. So this prevents the particles to move in a free way, perpendicular to the field, not along the field. Along the field, they are completely free. And in this way, they, it impedes that the particles bring the energy from the center of the plasma where it is hot to the walls where it is cold. Now, this movement is characterized by specific parameters. One is called the Larmor radius, which is the radius of the orbit. And typical values for electrons are very small. So you see of the order of, of uh, 50 micrometers. For ions, they are a bit larger, a few millimeters. This has to be compared to the typical dimensions of an ether plasma, which is, this is few meters. So actually, this is a very small dimension. This orbit compares to the overall dimension of the plasma. And they, they actually move at relatively high frequency. So the turning around frequency of this particle is quite high. So for the ions, it's typically 40 megahertz. This is comparable to the frequency of radio. FM radio emits in this type of frequency. The electrons are much higher frequency because they are, they are much lighter. And the frequency is 150 gigahertz. This frequency is actually of the order of 50 times higher than the microwave uh, frequency that we have in, in a microwave oven. As I said, an important observation here is that the force that affects the particles, actually, it only affects them in a perpendicular way, not along the field line. And this is quite important because this means when we apply a magnetic field, the losses along the field line are similar to one in a normal, in a normal gas. And because of this, what we do is we have to close the field lines to impede that there are two edges through which all the, all the particles lose their energy in a torus. Well, this is a, what we call mathematically a torus, is what we call in normal life a donut. And so we close the field lines, we apply, a, we, we instead of having a linear magnetic field, we do a loop magnetic field, closing like a donut. And this makes that the ends to the, the, the losses to the ends are disappear naturally. But this doesn't actually provide the final solution because 
the, when particles, charged particles are in a magnetic field of this type, because the magnetic field is higher on the inside part of the torus than on the outer part, it leads to the particles moving vertically up and down. And the electrons and the ions move in different directions. To short circuit this, what we create is another field along the direction, the small direction of the torus. And at the end, what we have is a magnetic field, which is a helix that winds around the torus. And in this way, we are actually short circuit this movement of the natural uh, movement of the particles in the torus and impede that the particles are lost to the world. And this is the basic of all magnetic confinement in toroidal devices. is the creation of a helical magnetic field with field lines that go around the torus and close on themselves eventually and keep the particles uh, from moving to the world by this uh, Lorentz force. Now, the fact that the particles are in a torus make trajectories, the trajectories uh, to be differentiated from what you would think. When particles go in the torus, they have to go through a very magnetic field, which is higher on the, on the inside of the torus, so on the, on the small size of the donut compared to the large size of the donut, so on the whole of the donut. And this means that some particles can actually not go above this magnetic field. And so we have two types of trajectories. One is called a passing trajectory, in which the particle goes around the torus and, and closes the helix, and this is what is shown in blue on the right side, but there are other particles that don't have enough energy to go above this hill, and then they become trapped. And these are what they are shown in, in, in red. And these particles follow a trajectory as they, as they go around the hill line that looks a bit like a banana, and they, we call them banana particles. And the width of this banana is several times the, the radius of the, of the small orbit. And the explanation of what these particles do in practice is shown on the right side. So the blue particles just follow from inside to outside of the torus, following the field line, a bit displaced from it. And the ones that are trapped, they follow a banana, they go up, they hit some point where they cannot go about this value of the field, and then they return. And this is what they call, and this is, as you can see, they look like a banana. And this is the basic for the uh, movement of the particles in a, in a, in a tokamak that has an old magnetic confinement devices in, based on a torus that has an, uh, a direct influence on the heat losses and the particle losses that, that this plasma has. And this is what is explained here. The way the, the plasmas lose energy is through collision. So we have a plasma in a magnetic field, and this is shown on the left side. We have a particle orbiting in a high temperature region, which is on the left side, and then it has a collision with another particle. It moves with its own Larmor radius, the green, the green uh, row, and then it jumps to another field line with a low temperature, and it follows its own orbit. And this is the way energy is transferred from the high to the, to the high temperature region to the low temperature region. And the typical step for this change is, is the, the Larmor radius, which is the orbit radius on the field line, and the collision time, which we saw depends on the velocity of the, of the particle at its temperature. When you are in a, in, a, in a magnetic field with a toroidal shape, then the particles, apart from going along the field line, they also follow these banana uh, shapes. And so when they jump from one field line to another field line in practice, they actually make a much larger jump, typically three to five times the small orbit, and it has a very large effect on the, on the amount of heat that the, that the plasma can lose because the amount of heat that the plasma can lose is related to the dimensions of the plasma divided by this step square. So if you make a step which is five times larger because you are in a, in a torus, the magnetic field has a toroidal shape, actually the, the, the time for the energy to go, to go out of the plasma actually decreases by a factor of 25. This is what we call neoclassical transport in tokamaks and in all magnetic confinement devices, and it's equivalent to what in, uh, in fluid dynamics is called laminar flow. So this is the minimum heat um, particle losses from a plasma in the absence of any turbulent effect. So this is what you see when you see a river flowing at low speed in which all the, all the, the current doesn't have any eddy or any turbulent effect. And this is the minimum uh, heat loss from a plasma in a, in a toroidal confinement device. Now, this may look a bit, um, I would say, academic in the sense that you have particles that follow field lines and they do this strange and funny movement. And does it have any consequence for, for, for practical life in, in the future? And actually it has a lot. One of them is what we call the bootstrap current. This is essential property that comes out from the particles following these, these strange orbits in by which 
when you create a difference in pressure between two sides, the orbits actually cause the flow of a current. And this is a very important um, effect in tokamaks because it means that by creating hot and dense plasmas, we are also able to create a current in the plasma without having to induce it by external means, as I will show later. And actually, this is an example of, of the demonstration that one, calculate, one can calculate this current with these formulas that come from these orbits, and this is measured in the JT60 tokamak in Japan. And what we find, as expected from theory, is that the amount of current that you drive is proportional to the pressure of the plasma. So having a very high pressure plasma not only is very good for fusion, to produce fusion, and produce more and more fusion, the higher the, the plasma pressure is provided that the temperature is high enough, it also drives current in the plasma. And this is very uh, important, for instance, for ITER, as it will discuss will be discussed in a follow-up presentation in this series, because it allows ITER to operate in a steady state uh, form. Now that we have explained the basic concepts of, of, uh, of uh, magnetic confinement, we go to the specificities of a tokamak. A tokamak is a specific magnetic configuration, and because of this, has its own specific features. So the, this is tokamak is not the only uh, configuration that there is. There are several magnetic configurations. I saw here the ones that have shown better results for fusion power production. One is the, the, the tokamak, the other is the stellator, and what is shown in this plot is the, the values of the magnetic field in the toroidal and poroidal components, so along the, the axis of the donut and across the small part, the small cross section of the torus, in the tokamak in stellator. So we typically see that in both cases the toroidal field is much larger in the cross section of this of this of this uh, plasma, and but in tokamaks the poroidal field actually can be significantly higher. Than, than typically in, in a stellator. Both configurations have pros and cons. Tokamaks have the ones that have achieved the best uh, fusion power performance so far. Stellators have the advantage that they are naturally uh, steady state. And these are actually the two field lines, which the two, the two research lines which are more active. Either because Tokamaks have demonstrated the plasma conditions closer to those required in a reactor, is the design that was chosen for it. So the tokamak configuration is shown here in a schematic way. So it's made of three key components, let's say. One is the toroidal field coils. These are in blue on the left side, and these are the ones that produce the magnetic field, the main magnetic field of the, of the donut uh, that provides the, the confinement. As I said, we need then to provide the poloidal field, which is the one that closes the helix, and this is produced by a central solenoid. So a tokamak to zero order is like a transformer in which we have a, a widening in which we change the current and we get another current in the plasma. The difference con con respect to a conventional transformer at home is that it has many wires on the two sides, what is called the primary and the secondary. In the case of a tokamak, the secondary is the plasma and it has a single third. So this this is the blue, the this is the pink. Uh, region shown in this in this slide. And this is what carries, in the case of ITER, up to 50 mega amp of plasma current. To control the position of this uh, pink uh, ring and to give it its safe, then there are these gray coils, which are what we call the poloidal field coils. And these are used, as I will show later, to shape the plasma, to control its position, etc. So these are the two main ingredients of the three main ingredients of the tokamak configuration: the central solenoid, the toroidal field coils, and the poloidal field coils. Now, in practice, uh, this produces, as I said, a helical field in a donut that has a uh, where the field lines go around this uh, dimension of the in the toroidal direction of the donut, and also in the poloidal direction, making a helix. And one of the things which is very important for the stability of a tokamak plasma is how many turns it makes in this direction to compare to how many turns it does in this direction. When the turns in this direction are not sufficient, then the plasma becomes unstable. And this is a very key parameter for the operation of the tokamak. Now, in addition to this very basic uh, concept, we can use the fact that the particles follow magnetic fields to uh, determine the way the plasma interacts with the wall in which the, or the vacuum vessel in which it is contained. And the, most successful configuration of this type, of this magnetic field configuration, is what we call 
a poloidal field divertor. This is based on the use of an external coil, which in the case uh, is shown at the bottom in, in, in yellow, that creates a magnetic field which is equal to that of the plasma. And we create an hour in the poloidal cross section, which is shown there, uh, by basically subtracting the edge field from the plasma with this coil. And this allows us actually to divert the field line. This is why the, the configuration is called a diverter, and decide on which part of the vacuum vessel the interaction between the plasma and the wall will take place. And this is what is shown here with an example of jet. On the left side is a conventional configuration, what we call a limited configuration, in which the plasma basically is round or ellipsoidal, and it contacts the wall at a given point where we, the, the element that produces more of the wall, from the wall, the right side is a, a poloidal magnetic configuration in which by this diversion of field lines, we actually decide which area of the wall the interaction between the plasma is uh, preferentially takes place. And this is very important as, as we will go, as I will show later, has been proven to be a very good tool to achieve very hot plasmas that keep the energy for very long time. And this is of course part of the of the ITER design. ITER is a tokamak with a poloidal diverter. Now what are the, the way the plasma establishes its equilibrium in tokamak? The plasma is a hot gas. It expands because the pressure in the plasma, in the center of the plasma, is higher than, than in the outer part. And we use magnetic fields to equilibrate this force. So, in fact, the, the, the plasma is in a force-free equilibrium. And the reason for this is the plasma mass actually is very small. The, the mass of an inter plasma is less than a gram. But the forces that the magnetic field applies to the plasma through this school of interactions which I've described before and the currents that circulate in the plasma are, are enormous. They are typically, we measure them in meganewtons and a meganewton is 100 tons. So actually the, the forces are, are very, very large. And because of this, the, the plasma itself uh, the inertia of the plasma is negligible. The plasma will move wherever the equilibrium of the forces are. To calculate this equilibrium, we use the, the, the force balance equation, which it says on the left side that the magnetic forces applied to the plasma have to be equal to the expansion forces of the plasma. This is represented with this operator, which is called a gradient, that basically quantifies the strength of the expansion of the force of the plasma and is determined by the difference in pressure in, various, in, the, two, in the, the center part of the plasma with respect to the edge. So if we want to get very high pressures in the plasma, we have to have very large magnetic fields, which is B, and very large plasma current, which is J. And this is actually the key, one of the key things that design, that leads the design and the operation of, of tokamak. You want to have the largest plasma current with the largest magnetic field because this gives you the higher, uh, the higher pressure and therefore the higher fusion power. Now, not all the equilibrium that you can achieve in the tokamak are stable. And this is because this balance of force may become imbalanced and then the plasma will react to this. And as I said, because it has no inertia, this reaction is extremely fast. So we can have equilibrium and this anal a mechanical analogous on the left side. We can have equilibrium which are stable, in which when you, we basically, the pressure increases a bit or the magnetic field increases a bit, increases a bit the system reacts and comes back to its original position. It can be marginally stable, where basically it doesn't matter if you make a, a, a perturbation or not because the, the system stays stable all the time. Then you have unstable, this means that uh, if you, you are in a condition in which just by chance you have achieved uh, uh, equilibrium of forces, if you deviate from this, basically the plasma will move and lose its property, or you can have metastable, which means that if you have a small oscillations of the magnetic field and the pressure, the plasma will recover, but if they are larger, because the, for instance the, the, the plasma temperature evolves in a quick way, then it can become me a metastable. Me mechanisms of the magnetic field to that are stabilizing. The stabilizing are the plasma current. The higher the plasma current and the higher the, the, the pressure gradient can actually trigger instabilities or the pressure gradient. With the, the expansion of the plasma on the on the high field side of the torus, so on the inside of the donut, actually is stable, is a, but on the outer side it can lead to instabilities. The field line itself pro provides uh, stabilization 
the field lines of the magnetic field, because the magnetic field, of course, is very strong, try to not to bend, and so they try to stay in their original configuration. So when you perturb them, they try to come back, and this provides stabilizing form. Also, if the plasma moves the magnetic field and tries to compress the magnetic field, the magnetic field tries to recover. Of course, there is the compression of the plasma itself, which is, of course, stabilizing. And depending when you exceed some limits, you can, you can basically go from circumstances which are stable to unstable, better stable, and this actually require uh, first that you avoid, avoid uh, approaching these limits, and second that when you approach, you have a control schemes to recover from, from these stabilities, so the plasma can maintain its density and temperature and produce fusion power. Here we are going to see what, what are instabilities that are triggering the plasma because the current in the plasma is too high. This is what we call current-driven instabilities, and they are concerned with the formation of the plasma of the plasma column that eventually, basically, hits the the, the wall of the of the of the reactor. And this is what we call a kink instability, and it's caused by the fact that when you have a, a plasma that distorts, the forces on the on the distorted part here at the bottom are larger than those on the on the on the other side, and then therefore the, the plasma is continuous bending until it hits the wall. This, of, this was observed very early in experiments in the 50s. For example, this is an example from the UK AA, in which they see what happens when you have a plasma carrying a current and the, 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 the level of plasma current exceeds this limit. You can see that it distorts and actually hits the wall. This can be seen in this case because the container of the plasma was a glass, a glass tube. Now, this has practical implications for tokamaks because it limits the, the, the maximum plasma current that can be driven by, by into, into the plasma. And of course, because you limit the plasma current, it limits the plasma pressure and therefore the fusion power production. Of course, you can optimize the design so that you, for a given value of the magnetic field, by playing with the geometry of the plasma, you can actually create the largest uh, plasma current. So, this is the factor which I mentioned before, which is the, the number of turns in the toroidal direction compared to the number of turns in the polyhedral direction that field lines make when they go around the torus. This limit of the, of the current driven instabilities means that you have to do at least two turns in this direction for one turn in this direction, but you can use the shape of the plasma to optimize the way these turns are done. And this is done by, by making a plasma which has a ellipsoidal shape, so it's not a circle, it is taller than wider, and the radius of the lips are B and A. And by maximizing this uh, as much as possible, you can actually make that for a given value of the, of, the, of the dimensions of the plasma in the horizontal axis, you can get the maximum current. And this is why into the plasma, and therefore the highest pressure and the highest fusion of power production. And this is why the interdesign, when you look at it, this is what is shown on the right side, as a plasma which is actually rather tall, much taller than, than wider. And this is to maximize the amount of plasma current that we can create in this plasma in a stable way, and therefore maximize fusion power production. Another thing that happens is that, as I said, pressure, particularly on the outer side of the donut, can lead to instabilities. When we exceed a given level of pressure, we trigger instabilities. These are shown here in this diagram in a schematic way. They look like solar flares, so plasma is expelled because the, the force of the magnetic field, the compression force given by the, by the magnetic field is not enough to compensate the expansion force of the plasma. This we can also optimized by changing the shape of the plasma, um, and this is, for instance, what it is shown on the right side, and this is why the heated plasma have this shape. They are not purely ellipsoidal, which was done to, um, to improve uh, the instabilities and to maximize the plasma current, but they also have this triangular shape, and this is characterized with a parameter which is called plasma triangularity. So actually, the heated plasmas are not of the green shape, but the, of, the, of the blue shape. They are triangular plasmas. As an example of what you can get by changing the plasma triangularity, characterized by this triangularity parameter delta, it is shown here for some experiments carried out at the European Tokamak jet, where you see that increasing the triangularity of this plasma from 0.14 to 0.5, more or less, you can actually increase the pressure of the plasma or the energy of the plasma by a factor of 1.5. And therefore, the fusion power by about a factor of two. So, Playing with the triangularity of the plasma is a way to achieve higher pressures in a stable way, and this is why the heater plasmas have this triangular shape. 
There are other instabilities which come because we elongate the plasma, which is called the vertical position instability. As I said, elongating the plasma is good because it allows this, the highest pl higher plasma current for the same number of turns, and therefore higher plasma pressure and fusion power production, but actually makes the plasma vertically unstable. And this can be explained in a simple way with the left diagram, in which we have a plasma which is maintained in equilibrium by creating currents in two coils. Now, the forces between these the plasma and these two coils is determined by the distance from the center of the plasma to the coil is the same, the plasma is in equilibrium. Now what happens if the plasma moves up a bit, for instance gets closer to the, to the upper coil? Then what happens is the force of attraction, this is Ampere's low force, where the force between two conductors is proportional to the currents in the conductors and their distance, becomes larger than the one at the bottom. And actually the plasma displaces and moves towards that coil. So this is an unstable equilibrium, clearly, because any small perturbation is like we are at the top of the hill, and if we move in any direction, we will fall, and uh, we have to control it so we remain at the top of the hill. And for this, one iter, as I will show later, and all tokamaks that operate with elongated plasmas have uh, coils, which actually create a field to clip the plasma in position. Some stabilization comes because when the plasma moves induced currents, in the, in the vacuum vessel that repel the plasma, but actually this is not enough when you have really elongated plasmas. You need the specific coils. And here on the right side are in green and red are the, the systems which are actually included in the interdesign to make sure that the plasma remains vertically stable. In addition, there is a capability to further uh, upgrade the, the coils of the central solenoid to also provide this functionality, but this is not included the baseline, it's an upgrade possibility. So you need this very important instability to control, and that is why it's a key driver of the, of the interdesign, and we have systems to, to deal with it. Now, there are other instabilities which are related to the way the plasma interacts with the magnetic field at the, at the level of particles, not as a level of just pressure or current, as I saw before, which are of high interest to fusion. And these are instabilities that we need to learn uh, how to control in it, as it will be discussed in a, in a follow-up talk. These are what are called fast particle instabilities. These are due to the fact that the fusion, fusion plasmas contain a large number of fast particles. I said the helium, which is produced by the fusion reaction, actually um, is produced with very high energies, of the order of three and a half mega electron volts. Actually, in, in, in velocity, this means that these particles have a typical velocity of 10,000 kilometers per second. This is actually 10 times larger than the typical velocity, which I mentioned for the, for the, for the thermal plasma. And so there can be a, a specific mechanism which these particles can interact with the field. And this is because waves can propagate in, in field lines, like the waves in the sea, the field lines can, can distort, as I mentioned, and the propagation speed of these waves is what we call the Alphen speed, which in Italy is typically of the order of 7,000 kilometers per second. Alphen got a Nobel Prize for, for this discovery. And, and what happens is that it's a, the same situation of a boat in a sea that if the velocity of the wave is larger than the velocity of the, of the boat, which is the fast particle, actually the wave pushes the particle, so the particle gains energy, and it's okay. When the velocity of the particle or of the boat is larger than the one of the wave, actually the particle gives energy to the wave. So what would happen in ITER if this stability is not controlled is that these particles give energy to the magnetic field, the magnetic field starts to oscillate and eventually can expel these particles. So this instability is specific to fusion plasmas, in particular because of the large number of fast particles. It also occurs in non-fusion plasma at lower energies, but they, they are typically less of an issue. And in the case of ITER, it's an instability that we have to understand and we have to control. So now that I have explained the, the features of the equilibrium of the tokamak plasma and its instabilities, we go to what are the characteristics of the confinement of in the particles and energy in the tokamak. This is important because, as I said, we have to heat up the plasma, but the plasma has to keep the energy. If the plasma loses the energy as very, very, in a very, very fast way, it is not possible to get conditions in which the fusion reaction will actually produce net energy. So uh, at this has to do with, uh, 
with particle transport and energy transport in Tokamak, which is by itself a very broad field. So I will always give very few touches here. So the first thing is that, as I explained, particles are subject to, to trajectories that we and lead to a minimum loss of rate of energy, which we call neoclassical. But in reality, the plasmas in the tokamak are not normally, except in some for some mechanisms, are dominated by neoclassical transport. The transport, in fact, is turbulent, and this is what we call in tokamaks anomalous transport and in magnetic fusion. Turbulent transport is triggered when we heat up the plasma or we increase its density when the magnitudes of the gradients are higher that can be sustained without turbulence. And this is a typical example of this is what is called the sun pine model, in which basically we have a, a, a pile of sand on a table and we add grains of sand. So what we normally do because of the friction between grains, you add sand, the, 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 the sand pile grows, and at some point, you exceed the threshold and you have what we call an avalanche. So there is a turbulent process by which the plasma or the, the sand pile reacts and expels the, exceed, the exceeding uh, sand. And this is the type of process that takes place in the tokamak. We increase the plasma density, we increase the plasma temperature, we exceed some gradients and then the plasma releases its energy. This is illustrated in the following movie. Done, uh, it's a simulation for a plasma in a American tokamak, D3D, in which you see how these turbulent uh, plasma eddies are set up. They are, of course, affected by flows. And in this way, energy is transferred from the hotter part of the plasma in the inner side to the outer part. By changing the flows in the plasma, the, the size of this eddy and therefore the speed at which energy is lost from the inside of the plasma to the world changes. And this is what we have to control in a, in, a, in a fusion device to achieve the optimum confinement. Now, the issue is that these simulations are very complex. By the way, this understanding has taken place a development in the last, I would say, decade or so to this level of, 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 uh, of predictability for ITER. And in fact, it is still a very complex matter. Because of this, uh, for the design of ITER, we have used a different approach. We, we have not based the design of ITER in evaluation of the magnitude of this turbulent transport from codes. We have a used approach which is more common when you have to, to address turbulent uh, phenomena, which is the one they follow in aeronautics, which is called the wind tunnel. So what you do is you know what are the intrinsic properties of the turbulent, how it scales with the size, how it scales with the velocity, etc. And do you do wind tunnel experiments in which you create plasmas which are in this critical dimension similar, and then you see how the, 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 the scaling, how the, the properties of the plasma scale. And for this, we, this is an example with the tokamaks from the European Union, but there are many around the intermembers that can be plotted in this scheme. And you see that we have tokamaks which have a similar size, similar properties to one of it, but different, different uh, sizes. And we have used this to develop a scaling law to predict the energy confinement of ether plasma. So how long will the energy in an ether plasma stay? This is very important because it determines the effectivity of fusion. And this is what is shown on the right plot. This is what it is called the ether scaling uh, law. Uh, for reference is the ITER scaling 98 law and predicts that the plasma in ITER will be able to keep the energy for three and a half seconds. And this is the basis for the design for the production of 500 megawatts of fusion power with a gain of 10, which is shown there. Now, there are in principle two basic confinement modes of this turbulent transport in tokamaks and also in other confinement devices. They are called L-mode and H-mode confinement. So the, the L mode confinement is the natural state of a plasma when the heating power that is applied to it, the heating power which is applied to it, it is low. What we have observed, and this was discovered in the 80s, in the 1980s, in the Aze Sabre Tokamak, is when the heat flux to the edge of the plasma goes about a given value. Actually, the turbulence at the edge of the plasma in the core adjusts so that the plasma energy increases. And this is what is shown here on the left side for the, an example for the jet tokamak in which one sees the change of this energy confinement time, so how much energy, how much time it takes the energy to leave out of the plasma, which of course we want it to be as long as possible when you have these confinement modes. This means that for a given amount of heating, 
power, the energy in the plasma is a factor of twice higher when you are in this H mode confinement device, in this H mode confinement regime. And this means that the fusion power is four times higher. So this actually is the operating mode of ITER, is the H mode confinement. The plasmas in ITER that achieve high fusion power are all based on the achievement of this, of this mode. And in practice, what it means is what is shown on the, on the right side. There, is some, there are some mechanisms by which the, the heat flux through the edge of the plasma uh, reduces when you access this mode, and you can sustain much larger pressure gradients than in a normal L mode condition. Overall, what it makes is that the overall plasma pressure goes up, actually doubles overall, and um, through a reduction of mostly of the transport at the edge of the plasma and also in part in the core through, in the, core, through the impact of this turbulent transport. This comes with the specific instabilities because you see toward the end of the plasma on the right plot, on the right plot, on the, the blue region, in the region of the edge of the plasma, and you get very, very large gradients of the pressure. And these are actually leads to specific instabilities, which are called ELMS, that we also have to control in ITER, as will be described in a, in a follow-up presentation. Now, uh, we have been talking about getting the plasmas to high temperature so that they can actually produce fusion power and high density uh, in ITER. How do we do this? So the first thing is that we have to heat up the plasma. We have to increase its temperature. And for this, we have various ways. One is to use the heat that the plasma produces itself because it carries a, 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 a current, and also because we buy external means. And this is what we are going to explain uh, now. So, as I said, ohmic heating in a plasma because of the feature of the um, uh, Coulomb collisions is not very effective. In fact, in ITER, even at operating at maximum current, the plasma temperature that we will achieve on average would be a few kilo electron volts, which means uh, this is not large enough to, compared to the 10 kilo electron volts or 100 million degrees that we have to achieve at least to get fusion. So we need other schemes to uh, heat the plasma to these very high temperatures. And what are these schemes? So the basic schemes are the use of microwaves and the use of injection of fast particles. So microwaves are shown on the right side consists on launching a, a wave that resonates with the particle trajectories. And for this, we have the electrons and the ions, which I mentioned before, go around the magnetic field at typical frequencies of 40 megahertz, for like radio for the ions, 150 gigahertz, so much higher than a microwave oven. And, and we can launch frequencies, uh, waves on these frequencies, which is called the ion cyclotron frequency and the electron cyclotron frequency, therefore the heating scheme are called electron cyclotron heating and ion cyclotron heating. And these waves go in phase with the particle and actually ac accelerate it and increase its energy. What it means in practice is because the velocity of the particle is larger, the orbits increase in radius, the Larmor radius increases. Another way is to inject ions at very high energy. And this is what is called neutral beam injection. This is a bit like if I want to increase the temperature of a cold water bucket, I take small amount of water, I heat it up to very high temperatures, and I mix it together. And this is another heating scheme, and that produces also very fast ions. The alpha heating, so the fusion heating, this, uh, this alpha heating, the alpha particles that are produced at high energy, also produce heat into the plasma. They transfer the heat from the ions to the electrons, through Coulomb collisions, and therefore the, the transfer of energy is, is dictated by the difference in velocity to the fourth power. And this means that even when we put hot ions for ether plasma conditions, we actually try to heat the electrons. And then the electrons collide with the thermal ions, these hot electrons collide with the thermal ions and actually, actually increase the temperature of the ions. So this is a very complex uh, physics itself, but very important for fusion. But the basic processes are are these ones here. Now, we also have to increase not only the temperature, we have to increase the density of the plasma. How do we do this in a normal way? Well, in a normal way, the way you do when you want to create a plasma is you just inject gas and ionize it. Now, the problem is, as the plasmas become hotter and they become larger, the penetration of these neutrals through the edge is very inefficient. This is shown on the left side 
on a, on a, for a jet example, where we see the neutral trajectories at the edge of the plasma, and you see that really very few actually end up going beyond this exploit. So the, the confined plasma, where the energy and the fusion power production is, is, it takes place. So in the case of ITER, this problem, because the plasma is even hotter and the dimensions are larger, is even uh, more, uh, is more of an issue. And actually, of the neutrals which are at the edge of the plasma, to be ionized, to create this plasma, only one in 100, one in, in, in a thousand, actually make it uh, to the core. And therefore, this is not a very effective way to fuel thermonuclear plasmas. So what we do to increase the plasma density, which we need to do to produce fusion, because the plasmas to produce fusion have to be hot and dense, what we use is we inject solid uh, deuterium and tritium. So we form a small cylinders of deuterium and tritium, and we really shoot them in the plasma like with a pneumatic gun. And in this way, we are able to uh, go deeper into the plasma before these particles are ionized. So these particles, are solid, they are like a cube of ice, we, we make into a very hot gas, so they first become solid, then eventually they become gas and they are ionized. And actually the dynamics of this ionization can help the particles to go deeper into the plasma. And this is why, in, in the case of ITER, we inject the particles for fueling in various ways. And you can see there, they are on the, on the right side, there are the, the pink traces, and there are some of these pink traces that go through the inner side of the torus. And this is because we have learned from physics that when the particles are injected from the inner side of the torus, actually the, the processes that lead to ionization and, and plasma physics processes related to, to the creation of a high pressure region where these, these particles are injected, actually pull the particles toward the center of the plasma and, and actually uh, increase the efficiency which we can put the fuel into the core of the plasma. And this is a very important phenomena. This is an example from the Ars de Stokamak of the Mass Plug Institute of Plasma Physics, where you see one of these solid uh, pellets of deuterium going into the plasma from the high free side and actually penetrating rather deeply, which is what we want to get in, in ITER for fusion, for, for fueling of, of fusion plasmas. Now we have a plasma which is hot, is dense, maintains its energy, but eventually, part of the energy of the plasma, the one which is not produced by, by in neutrons that goes over the whole dimensions of the vacuum vessel, ends up going to the wall. So the alpha heating, for instance, goes to the wall, eventually. So what are the processes that take place when this energy arrives at the wall of the tokamak, which is, of course, made of solid material? And how do we have to, what are the issues that we have to handle these fluxes? And what are the solutions that we have that we will demonstrate in it? So the first thing is that, as I said, part of the plasma power goes to the wall. And because particles follow field line, as I mentioned before, when you have a poroidal diverter configuration, you are actually able to carry this power to specific places. So this is a bit like if we have a, a water tank on the left side, which overflows and there is a slope. By, by, by having a slope, first we determine where the overflows go, but also depending on the holes in this slope, we can determine how much falls near the tank or how much falls farther away. In the case of, of, uh, of fusion plasmas, because particles along the field lines, or the magnetic field lines move without any restriction, this means that actually the, the, the losses are concentrated on a very small part of the, of the machine. So we can actually decide and choose materials for these areas which are specifically resistant to flux, to this uh, in large power fluxes from the plasma. So as you have seen in a previous presentation by René Raffred, he has described the first wall of ether, which is made of beryllium, and most, but there most of the power fluxes actually arrive at the diverter, which is what is shown at the bottom and is made of tungsten. So these fluxes actually, as I said, are very large. Ether loses typically of the 500 megawatts of fusion power that we are going to produce, plus 50 megawatts of additional heating, we expect that the 100 megawatts that go directly by plasma, of the order 100, 100 something, go to directly to the plasma, to the by plasma particles, to the wall of the, of, the, of, the, of the device. And most of them, I said, arrive at the diverter, which is the tungsten, uh, which is equipped with tungsten target. In fact, 
the typical area because the, the particles follow the field line so quickly and they are unimpeded because there is no force on them because the, this Lorentz force is only perpendicular to the magnetic field. Actually, this power that is 100 megawatts will actually fall on few square meters of the wall at the divertor, actually, at the bottom part. So this means that the typical fluxes that the divertor would be subject to in ether if we don't uh, do anything, basically, if we would uh, not uh, do means to reduce it, can be up to, let's say, 50 megawatts per square meter. Just to put in context, the power that would go to this divertor heater would be similar to the, to the heat flux on the sun. So obviously, we cannot design a component that can take the heat of the sun. And in fact, there, is a lot of, there has been a lot of progress to design components in ITER to handle very high heat fluxes. And the ITER divertor design can handle 10 megawatts per square meter. So it is about one fifth of what we would get there. So what do we do? to reduce the heat flux of the plasma that would fall on this diverter to acceptable values from the engineering point of view. So we have these power fluxes that we have to reduce because they are not suitable for the, for the plasma facing components that we can design with the technology that we have, and therefore we have to reduce them. And for this we use actually plasma physics. So what we do is we actually inject impurities at the edge of the plasma. In ether, typically, we will inject neon. This is an example from the D3D tokamak, where this is achieved by carbon. And this neon radiates the energy of the plasma very much like a neon bulb. So this energy that would flow to the target, we make a plasma that has specific conditions at the edge so that it can radiate the power away. And basically, it spreads the power of, uh, instead of concentrating in this very small area, or one to two square meters, spreads the power of the over the whole world of ether, which is not then uh, leads to very large power fluxes, in fact. And this is what we, we, we need the specific plasma conditions, what we call technically divertor detachment. And this, as shown on the right side, can actually help to reduce a lot the heat flux in ether. So with this solution ether, we expect to have a thermonuclear plasma producing this amount of power, uh, 500 megawatts, so with about 100, 100 something will flow to the edge, and most of which we will actually radiate away without depositing directly on a small area of the world. And this is the solution to the heat exhaust in ether. Now, there is an issue, which is when you put impurities in the plasma, at the edge they may not stay in the divertor region, they may get to the core of the plasma and then they radiate the, the plasma energy from the core of the plasma itself and decrease temperature. So one of the things that we have to demonstrate in ITER is that we are able to have this solution and integrate a large uh, impurity and radiation at the edge of the plasma while keeping the core very clean and producing fusion power. And with this, I just want to show an example. This is an example of a video of a similar experiment where energy is radiated by nitrogen emission as the acid the tokamak. What you see on the left side is a plasma in which the power to this divertor is not uh, decreased. So you see the divertor gets very hot, as you would expect. On the right side, it is the same plasma with the same power level where the radiation is produced and evacuated over the, world va the whole vacuum vessel. And you can see that on the right side, the temperature of the divertor remains very low, demonstrating that this scheme can be used uh, uh, to, irradiate the, to radiate the power away and also in a controlled way. With this, I come to the conclusion of my presentation. So I think I have tried to show that tokamak physics is a very rich field. We have a lot of plasma physics. We have physics of atomic physics. We have physics of materials, of the interaction of the plasma with the world. In general, the basic physics process for it are well understood. We have also achieved all the plasma parameters which are required for ITER to access, uh, have success in its mission in a separate way in different tokamak experiments. What we have to do in ITER is to combine all the physics process. And this is actually very difficult to predict. That is why we have to build ITER and demonstrate it. We can do calculations, but the calculations, because the interactions are very complicated, are very difficult to produce the result which is accurate enough. So the ITER mission is to demonstrate that all the physics that we understand today can be integrated and in a way that allows the plasma to self-sustain by producing alpha heating and net fusion power. And in this sense, the inter-tokamak is the ultimate fusion experiment. Thank you very much for your attention.